дети биткоин, как будто неправильно подходит об этом говорить. Я бы сказал, что Ethereum есть фи фичи и возможности делать такие вещи, которые у биткоина нет. То есть это также как сказать, что там может ли там телефон победить апельсин. You're Vitalik Buterin in 2016, and you've just created Ethereum, the blockchain that's revolutionizing the internet and outperforming Bitcoin. You pioneer smart contracts with Ethereum. You create a successful decentralized app ecosystem. Most importantly, you spawn competition with Solana, Cardano, Sui, Polkadot, and Mami Token, aka Iggy Azalea's token, just to name a few. But then, poof, Ethereum breaks. Not the application itself, but Ethereum's leading project, something called the DAO. The DAO suffers a major hack, and $55 million in funds donated by Ethereum users is stolen. Imagine you just donated your life savings to a project you genuinely thought could improve humanity, and one person steals almost all of it. Moreover, this hacker brags that they stole from you. While Vitalik Buterin didn't create the DAO, it was Ethereum's top application. If Ethereum was Xbox, the DAO was Halo. Can you imagine Xbox without Halo? Not to mention, what made all this worse is that Vitalik Buterin made a controversial decision when handling the DAO hack. Vitalik directly involved himself after the hack, a big no-no in crypto, where everything is supposed to be as free from third-party intervention as possible. You know, Joseph Lubin, the guy who used to work for Goldman Sachs, he's trying to do damage control, so he's you know, putting Vitalik out in front of everybody. For years, the DAO hack was the largest hack ever, and nobody knew who did it, until now. Today, we will reveal who this enigmatic person is behind the hack, and if Vitalik screwed up with how he handled this situation. I'm Isaiah McCall of 99 Bitcoins, and this is the $55 million mistake that Vitalik Buterin made with Ethereum. But first, a word from our sponsor. This video is brought to you by Freedom Fighters. Buy Freedom Tokens to vote for your favorite candidate this election season, either Comicop or Magatron. The choice is yours. You can also stake Freedom Tokens and get some sweet rewards. So check it out in the description below. Now, back to the video. To hack the DAO, you needed three things. A sharp eye for glitches, insider connections, and a digital trail leading straight to you. Today, one man checks all three boxes. But first, let's rewind to 2016, when Ethereum was the undisputed king of the cryptocurrency market. If they had given MVP awards to cryptocurrencies, Ethereum would have won it from 2016 to 2020. Back in 2016, Ethereum outperformed every major crypto besides Bitcoin. And the DAO was Ethereum's crown jewel. DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. And the 2016 DAO was a decentralized venture fund controlled by investors. Anyone who held DAO tokens held the power to vote where to invest the entire fund. It was a hedge fund for normal people like you and me, not Wall Street elites. The DAO's funding hit $150 million, putting immense pressure on lead programmer Christoph Jens. No one expected the DAO to be this freaking successful, but the entire Ethereum community was behind it. Ethereum was riding on this app, and then hit the fan. Unfortunately, the DAO project had a mistake in its code, line 666. Naturally, this led to conspiracy theories that the DAO hack was an inside job. Once the DAO hack broke, everything went into jeopardy. As Griff Green, an Ethereum programmer, said immediately after the hack, there were so many fears. Does this destroy Ethereum? Does this destroy DAOs? What's gonna happen to all this money? Here's journalist Nathaniel Popper breaking down the DAO hack. On the first days that it was operational, you had this attacker who came in and managed to take advantage of the contracts in a way that basically siphoned about half of the money into uh, an account under the control of the attacker. Essentially, the hacker, which soon became more than one, found a way to take money, and before the program updated how much it had left, they could ask for more. It's like going from bank teller to bank teller, asking for $1,000 without them subtracting it from your account. This became the largest digital heist in history. Ethereum's dog day afternoon. Attica! 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 For 
years, nobody knew who hacked the DAO. The mystery lingered like a ghost haunting the Ethereum blockchain. That is, until now. An investigation by Forbes journalist Laura Shin points to one man who hacked the DAO, Toby Hanisch, a programmer from Austria living in Singapore. Toby was heavily involved in the Ethereum community and was the CEO of his own crypto company called 10X, a project that failed to launch a crypto debit card. He denied the allegations made by Shin and even wrote her an email stating, quote, your statement and conclusion are factually inaccurate. In that email, Toby promised to provide details refuting her findings, but never reached back. Just like my dad who walked out on us. Love you, dad. Recently, Toby's ex-partner, Dr. Julian Hosp, has also pointed the finger at Toby as the hacker in question. Here's Dr. Hosp. And now he talks about suddenly a $50,000 investment that is coming in and that he would use to book for flights and trip and so on. Okay, so that's the 9th of June. Just kind of keep this in perspective. DAO hack happens on the 17th of June. Here, he still says he's waiting for some money, doesn't know. Now, of course, I'm not like, look, coincidences happen, right? I, I And at that point, I didn't consider this one like one bit, I didn't even think about this. June 20th, okay, I'm booking off flights. This may just be a total coincidence. It just makes so much sense. Me sitting there and maybe being the person in between what he needs to get access to the treasury. And later on, after Laura explained all this to me, also getting access possibly, right, to the DAO funds. As for the evidence that Shin brought to the table, here it is. One, Toby was obsessed with the DAO pointing out 52 vulnerabilities in his code and even telling his partner to short Ethereum right before the hack. Two, he emailed the DAO's lead engineer about four potential attack vectors, warnings that were dismissed. Three, the hacker cashed out using Grin, Toby's favorite privacy coin, and withdrew to a Grin node called, get this, grin.toby.ai. And four, Toby sent a final cryptic message to DAO engineer and likely Greek man left Terrace Karaptaptis, quote, sorry if I messed up the plan. So where's Toby today? Well, he just exit scammed his company 10X for $200 million. But this isn't just about him because Toby's actions set the stage for Vitalik Buterin's greatest mistake of them all. The $55 million mistake that Vitalik Buterin made. After the hack, Vitalik Buterin and company had two choices. Let the hacker keep the loot, what is known in crypto as a soft fork, which means they don't really change anything with the code. Or two, play God, rewrite the code, return the stolen funds, and pretend this nightmare never happened, AKA a hard fork. It's an easy call for a centralized giant like Visa or Microsoft to intervene after a hack. But Ethereum's decentralized governance wasn't supposed to interfere with a legitimate exploit like what the DAO had in its code. One was in charge of Ethereum, Vitalik, or the other people. They, they, they should have just thrown Steven Tool and the Slocky team under the bus saying they uh, wrote horrible code and uh, people need are they're responsible and uh, those that donated uh, the money are responsible. What the hacker did might be morally wrong, but it was technically legal because of the programmer's mistakes in the code. So what do you do when everything's falling apart? Here's what the Ethereum community thought about how to fix this issue. This time in order to see, to determine whether we're gonna do something about it or whether we're just going to let it go. I don't think that Ethereum has the balls to uh, leave the theft as is. They're talking about hard forking. Gavin Wood, the co-founder of Polkadot and Ethereum, was somewhat against a hard fork, stating the hacker acted within the rules of Ethereum. He saw exploitable code and exploited it. Gavin was in the minority here, especially against Vitalik Buterin. This might be one of the reasons he left Ethereum in 2016. They can say, well, honestly, this contract had a bug, had a flaw, but it was nonetheless well-defined. And the attacker, they, they did drain against people's expectations, mm -mm. but those expectations were flawed, just as the code was flawed, and the attacker is in some sense utilizing what was fair, this, this fair flaw that he found. So there is an argument to be made for the fact that the, the system is executing correctly. Now, of course, there's also the argument that, well, hold on, expectations, <laughs> wide expectations, were that this contract was gonna do this, and it doesn't do that. In an open letter to the down Ethereum community, the hacker claimed the reward was legal and threatened to sue anyone who tried to undo their work. Their menacing parting words were, I hope this event becomes a valuable learning experience for Ethereum. Best of luck, what a savage. The hacker had a point. It didn't help that Ethereum's official documentation says these applications will exist without any possibility of downtime, censorship, fraud, 
or third party interference. What's the point of having cryptocurrency if we still have the same centralization issues we're trying to escape from from corporate giants like Google, Visa, and Microsoft? In any case, they did it. Ethereum hard forked in the summer of 2016 under the influence of Vitalik Buterin. The funds were returned, but it also created a second cryptocurrency called Ethereum Classic, a chain with no bailout or intervention. Vitalik knew the more controversial option was a hard fork. To directly involve himself and other founders went against some of the core principles of Ethereum. But like he told Lex Friedman years later, hard forking due to philosophical differences, even if it's compromises like decentralization, is quote, better. Some aspect to a hard fork where you're trying to upgrade a, what is it, airplane while it's flying. There's definitely a bit more risk of like a, a split as a result of a hard fork than as a result of a soft fork. It's highly undesirable, right? But well, it depends. Like if it's a split because of a bug, then that's horrible. If it's a split as a result of political differences, then I think like a split is better than, you know, one side being forced to basically just like suck it up and, ac and accept the majority position, even if it really hates it. Well, there's also political connections throughout the history of the United States. It's like sometimes groups of people that strongly disagree with each other mm -hmm. should be forced to work it out. So if you were to look at the way things worked out with the block size wars mm -hmm. and there was a split, putting on your historian hat, you mentioned offline you like Dan Carlin. So if, if Dan Carlin were to do an episode on the uh, <laughs> on the block size wars, uh, do you think uh, it could have turned out better or do you um, are you OK with the way it turned out? I'm definitely disappointed with what happened with the block with the, the big block side. Um, I think the source of my disappointment is that like one of the things that you notice when just looking at like this political disagreements generally, especially when you have environments where, you know, they're authoritarian or like single party dominated and then there's some opposition party and the opposition often has like very legitimate grievances. But at the same time, the thing you notice is that often enough, the opposition just sucks, right? Like it just doesn't have, you know, political capacity. It doesn't have like the ability to come up with policy. The irony of a bailout was not lost on the Ethereum community. As Vinay Gupta, a strategist at Consensus said, quote, it turns out we have a lot in common with the central banks. Maybe not the technical or legal level, but at the political level, people in our community expect us to make things better for them. Although the DAO intervention is a blemish on Ethereum's legacy, it's mostly forgotten about today. When the DAO attack happened, Ethereum was trading for around $10. Now it's sitting around $3,000, with predictions to hit $10,000 in a year or two. And whether Toby is a hacker or not, the DAO hack remains one of the most significant events in crypto history, for better or for worse. A final thought. Maybe Ethereum's future is just too damn exciting to be derailed by one massive screw up. This was the only time a hack of this magnitude blindsided the ETH community. It was pretty much FTX before FTX. Ethereum was basically a roller coaster that went off the rails, but was way too much fun not to want to ride again. The community stands by it. They say the DAO hack intervention was a one-off. That being said, hacks against dApps still happen today, with nearly 2 billion stolen from crypto projects in 2024 without any intervention. When it comes to the DAO, most believe Vitalik and crew made the only call they could, the right one. As Cornell professor Iman Goon Sir, who led research after the DAO hack put it, Ethereum's community has been science-driven, open, and civil, a shiny example for others. Moreover, if Ethereum continues in this direction, Vitalik sees it as the most dominant crypto in this space, even more successful than Bitcoin. So Ethereum in 2032, you have a node, your node runs on your phone. Every uh, 12 seconds or 32 seconds or whatever number we uh, agree on, you download 3.6 megabytes of data, you hash it, you do a couple of uh, elliptic curve equations to check a snark, that's it. You know the block is valid. Wait uh, 12 seconds, get 3.6 megabytes of data, hash it, do some elliptic curve operations, verify the snark, and uh, valid. 12 seconds later, data, hash, elliptic curve check, valid. The whole process just becomes incredibly sleek and uh, seamless to the point where like literally a phone could even do it, right? For us the 99 Bitcoins, we do think the down intervention gives other layer ones like Sui and Polkadot a chip on their shoulder from never having a scandal like this. If you wanna learn more about those tokens, check it out right here. Even Bitcoin with its lightning network, something Vitalik once dismissed early on, is growing without any Drama. On a deeper level, the DAO hack remains a salient philosophical case in crypto economics. It forced the entire crypto space to confront its ideals. 100% decentralization versus intervention when things aren't convenient for you. So what's your take? Was the hard fork the right call or did Ethereum lose some street cred with that decision? Drop your thoughts in the comments below 
and thanks for watching. Hey guys, we're trying to bring a lot more long form, high quality videos like this to the channel. So if you like these, please comment down below, like and subscribe, let us know so we can keep these going and so my boss doesn't fire me. And if you wanna check out more of the long form, high quality content we're trying to do, be sure to check out videos here, there, they're probably gonna pop up somewhere. So check those out, have a good day.